in Ephesians. Oh, we're in Ephesians chapter 2. That's right, we sure are. So as you're looking, imagine for a second that Christianity started in Mexico, that it started there, and it's a purely Jesus was a Mexican guy, thoroughgoing, and then it spread to America. And on the border of Mexico, America, you have, let's be the standard, we'll say they spoke, you know, Espanol, and they, their skin tone was different, and their culture was different. And once they got into that Rio Grande, they started coming over to Tejas, to Texas. Things were different, right? Just we'll say hypothetically, they were more white-skinned, and they spoke English, and their culture was different. But it spread, and news spread, and right off the bat, something was a major, major, major issue, which is, do they have to adopt Mexican culture and language before they can believe in Jesus? Is this a Mexican religion? Because then it starts spreading and spreading. But well, before it spreads all the way up to you know, Florida and Maine and California, initially it's that borderline where it's spreading enough where Americans, let's pretend for a second they're just purely white. I mean, they're black, fine, whatever. But the point is I'm making the contrast where it'd be very easy to tell on a normal day that you've crossed over to a different culture. And so... And there, there was well, this, this conundrum because originally they speak Espanol, but now as it spreads, English becomes the dominant language of this Christian religion. That is exactly what happened in the first century church. In the first century church, it wasn't in Mexico, but of course it was all Jewish. They spoke in Aramaic and Hebrew. They followed the Mosaic law, and then Jesus comes along as the Messiah. They were thoroughgoing Jews. Jesus was Jew, his disciples were Jews, their earliest disciples were Jews. Everybody was Jew, Jew, Jew. And then. It started spreading to a brand new area where pagans or non-Jews lived. And they looked different, and they smelled different, and their culture was different, and their language was different. They spoke Greek. In the western part of the world, it was Latin. But right off the bat on those border territories, as it were, in Asia Minor and other places, it created hostility. It created hostility. And so the number one pressing issue in the earliest church, you can see this in the book of Acts, go to Acts 15, was... Is it simply a Jewish religion, this Jesus-ism, or is it for everybody? And what must a non-Jew do or believe before they can follow Jesus? Because he started way down there in a place called Israel down in Jerusalem, but now we're way off here in Ephesus, and we're in Rome. What do, do they have to be like the Jews and live like them and eat like them and act like them too? It became a gigantic deal. And so eventually the church decided they don't need to be just like the original followers. They need to follow Jesus, but the way it looks will be different for different cultures. But the hostility was often there for various reasons. We're going to talk about that now. So chapter 2, verse 11. Verse 11. You have it, I mean? Now this is after Paul makes the great point that grace has saved you, right? Jesus saved you, you can't earn it. Now, he's talking, therefore, remember that at one time... It's plural. Y'all Gentiles in the flesh. Now, now, Gentile means everyone who's not a Jew. So if you're not a Jew, that is you, which I assume I think right now is everyone in this room and probably those watching online. He's talking to us. And my analogy, we're the Americans who have adopted someone else's, as it were, religious background. Don't forget y'all Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision. That is, Jews call you the uncircumcised, um, which is made by flesh by hands. Remember that y'all were at one time separated from the Messiah, from Christ. You were separated. That's us, Hill Church. Uh, we were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and we were aliens or strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You were basically good people. That's what a lot of people's translation must say, apparently, because that's what a lot of people believe. You were all good. You were doing your best. That's not what Paul said at all. It caused a lot of hostility. These different cultures caused a lot. So if you were just a Jew living in Asia Minor, you must understand they stood out like a big sore thumb. Their culture was different. Their language, very, very different. Uh, Jews worship one God, Yahweh, and they went to the temple if they could make it. Gentiles, many, many gods, went to temples all over the place. Jews ate certain things called uh, kosher meals or kashrut. These are dietary restrictions. You don't eat pork. You don't eat shellfish. You don't eat all these things. Gentiles eat basically whatever they want all the time. You could notice them. In fact, they even smelt differently. Yes, they did, depending on what they ate. 
uh, Jews took off one day of work every week. What do you think the Gentile thought about them? Why are they skipping work? What is wrong with them? There's no weekends in the ancient world. There's no weekends. Jews said, yes, there is. There's one day we don't do junk. Hey, where's Bob? He doesn't work today, man. Remember? Those Jews, they're weird. They don't work. Jews got circumcised. Virtually every single Gentile did not. Jews typically lived by themselves. Gentiles did not. And of course, the temple was revered. They would often pray toward the direction of the temple. Gentiles did not. I think of analogy, another analogy is the Amish. Uh, my mom used to live in Pennsylvania. We'd go there near, you know, you see it, or, or Florida, different parts of Florida. There's big Amish country there, uh, area. And you see the wagons going down and the hats and the whole shebang. I mean, it's very, very different. And you just, the point is, it's easy to spot when someone is of the Amish or, or the Mennonite and so forth. It's easy to spot them. They look different. Act, they even have different accents. Now, it's not exactly the same. My point is, it's easy to stand out. But analogy, that's what was in the ancient world. The Romans looked down on the Jews. The Jews looked down on the Romans. This is before they became Christians, and then not much changed after, but I'll talk about that in a second. When the Romans thought of the Jews, there was hostility because they were so different. They were so different. There's no melting pot in the ancient world. See, we have something brand new called like African-American or whatever, a Mexican-American. We try our best to, as American culture, they called the so-called melting pot. What's supposed to be that way historically. In the ancient world, in most parts of the world, they do not melt anything together. It's our people, our tribe. And so the Romans had a lot of suspicion against the Jews. One guy named Tacitus wrote about the Jews. Now, I'm not saying everything he said was right or true, but here's what he said about the Jews. Tacitus said this, To establish his influence over these people for all time, Moses introduced new religious practices quite opposed to those of us all other religions. Ebola. The Jews regard as profane all that we hold sacred. On the other hand, they permit all that we abhor. Well, whatever their origin, these rites, these rituals, are maintained by their antiquity for a long time. The other customs of the Jews are base and abominable. Ugh. And they owe their persistence to their depravity. They're so disgusting. That's why they keep lasting. For the worst rascals, I like that translation, rascals, little rascals, um, among all the peoples, they're the worst, renouncing their ancestral religions where they should be believing in. Again, the Jews are extremely loyal to one another, and they're always ready to show compassion. But toward every other people, they feel only hate and enmity. Tacitus says, they sit apart at meals, they sleep apart, and although as a race they are prone to lust, they abstain from intercourse with foreign women. What is wrong with them? Yet among themselves, nothing is unlawful. They adopted circumcision to distinguish themselves from other peoples by this difference. Those who are converted to their ways, though a convert, follow the same practice. And the earliest lesson they receive is to despise the gods, he means Greco-Roman gods, to disown their own country and to regard their parents, children, and brothers as of little account. However, they take thought to increase their numbers. They regard it as crime to kill a late-born child. Oh, they're so dumb. They don't kill their babies. Every Roman, I mean, that was normal. Abortion was the standard thing in Roman society. Jews didn't do that. And they believe that the souls of those who were killed in battle or by the execution are immortal. Hence comes their passion for begetting children and their scorn of death. Oh, what is wrong with them? And this was in basically every single town in Asia Minor because everywhere they went, there was a Jewish population. And then what the Jews thought about the Romans were similar. But Paul says this as a Jew. When he's talking about a non-Jew, a Gentile, he says this, what we just read. Well, let me tell you about you. <laughs> you don't have the Messiah. You don't have access to the blessings of being amongst God's people, the commonwealth. And you have no Christian hope. You have no Christian hope. Y'all are just lost. And so the Jews would walk around. Paul would walk around Ephesus and all the town, Laodicea and so forth, uh, Philadelphia. He would walk around Philippi and Thessaloniki. He, these towns, he would just shake in his head. He does in the book of Acts, he goes uh, there, Agapicus. He says, listen, I mean, I've been to Athens. I see that you're religious people, but he shook his head. Look at all these false idols. Look, and look at the people are half naked and they're this. And like, he just shook his head. Y'all are some defiled people. And the Jew, Romans look at them like, what a bunch of weirdos. It created constant hostility. And this was a real pressing problem in the church as Jews who believed in Jesus came to church, Jewish Christians, 
And as Gentiles like you and me believed in Jesus and became Christians, and all of a sudden, we're sitting this close to each other in a building. But their biggest buildings would have housed maybe 50 people because they meant house churches until about the third century. So imagine this one section here is the whole church of Hill Church. And in this section right here are Jews who converted to believe Jesus the Messiah, who look and act and smell and talk like a Jew. And then a Gentile looks and acts and smell of various nations. Gentiles didn't all say the same thing and do. They had all their background. And some of you are slave sitting right ne next to your master on the same level playing field. So it brought hostility. So the question Paul's asking is, is it possible to unify people with radically different ethnic and religious cultures that are separated by the requirements of the law? The Jews said, you can't do this. We're not the same. You don't have a covenant. Is it possible? Paul lived this world. You and I might not, but he lived it and breathed it every day. And Paul made tents as a tent maker in the towns. And he would have worked up right next to shop to other people who made tents. And so he sees Romans and Greeks and thus He sees these people going down the street and he's shopping, and he's dealing sales with them. And he sees fellow Jews. He's looking around all the time going, I hear and I sense and I feel the tension all the time. It's like if they really, really couldn't stand the Amish, which I love them and everybody. My point is, that, oh, I just can't, oh, I can't stand them. But he's like, and I'm a Jew and I know I sense that all the time. Is there anything at all to make these people get together? Now, if you're a sociologist, you'll say, sure, there's one thing that unites various people groups immediately, and that's a common enemy. That's the fastest way to get people to join together, have a common enemy. That's how Russia and America can join against the Nazis, all the while hating Russia more than the Nazis, but that's how you join together. The second way to do it is to have something in common or a value. And Paul says this in verse 13. He says this in verse 13. But now... In Christ Jesus, y'all who were once far off, that's us Gentiles, have been brought near in the blood of Christ. You were far off, now you're close. You were aliens, exiled, now you're close. Verse 14, for he is our peace. He's how we have peace. He's how we're united. He who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. I'll come out of that wall in a second. By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances. And he means, of course, the Torah, the law, the Mosaic law. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to do this. He abolished that in his flesh. That he might create in himself one, literally in Greek, one new man, one new person, in place of the two. Not a melting pot, but someone brand new. So making peace. So making peace. He will join together two massive kinds of people, Jew and everybody else. He's going to form to one person and make peace. Verse 16, and he might reconcile us both to God and in one body through the cross. One body through the cross. Thereby bringing the hostility to an end. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off, to you all who are far off, that's the Gentiles, and peace to those who are near him, that is the Jews. For through him we both have access to, in one spirit, to the Father. We have access to one spirit in the Father. Some people think that when he says the wall of hostility, he has a particular structure in mind. That's at the temple grounds. There was a wall that took out the inner part of the temple from the outer part. And that's how far Gentiles could get close together. That's typically preached and taught, but most scholars concur. That's probably not what he has in mind. But it's a good analogy. That is, that's how far Gentiles get to close to the inner temple. There's a line. You can't get closer. I have an analogy. I like a better analogy, I think, and that is the Berlin Wall. If you don't know your history, the Berlin Wall was created in 1961 after the fall of World War II. And then Russia set that up in Germany, but also in Berlin. And it divided. It was not just literal blocking of people, which is the goal. Russians didn't want the Eastern people getting to the West. They, it was a way to imprison them. But it was also symbolic of two radically different cultures and government styles and everything. It was, a, it was a massive symbol of separation. That wall separates two very different people groups that cannot get along. Now, it was horrible and it was wretched, but I like to think of that. It's as if Jesus came and they said... Uh, <laughs> uh, Tear down that. I can't do a, of a president's voice. But anyway, when he says, right, what does he say? Gorbachev, 
tear down this wall. He tears, imagine if he says, Jesus, tear down this wall. And he did. But on both sides, one side's full of Jews who were Christians, and the other side's full of Gentiles who were Christians. And the only way Jews and Gentiles can get together is through the death of Jesus. He becomes the way to reconcile two very different people groups into one, and thus end all the hostility. To end all the hostility. In the Christian worldview, I'm convinced this is absolutely true. If you really want people to be united, really, it's not just to have a common enemy, which we could do that. We say, we all fight against Satan, the devil, Satan, Satan, we could fight it. That's, uh-uh. No, that's not biblical. It's we're united by the same person who died for my sins. And in Christ Jesus, we're one family together. He uses the word body, fine. We're one unit together. And Paul is saying, I need you to understand this, Gentiles in the Asia Minor churches. And I would say, Paul would say, Hill Church, you need to understand this. Don't forget where you came from. At one point, you were way out there, distant, on your own, dead in your sins. He says earlier, remember in the letter, now you have been brought near by the blood of Christ and together we have all, not, you didn't become Jews, you have now joined together with other Jewish Christians and together in the body of Christ you've become one. Now we Christians have to be real honest. We have done a, we've sometimes done a very, very bad job at this. There have been times we have failed miserably at joining together different cultures and races under the name of Jesus Christ. Miserably. I mean, I had a long, I, I kept it simple this morning. Remember, so like in 1861, the pastor of First Baptist, a uh, Presbyterian in Columbia, South Carolina, said this As long as that African race and its comparative degradation coexist side by side with the white, a bondage slavery is its normal condition. As long as the black people are so degraded in them, it's, they should be slaves. That's his point. The relation of master and slave stands on the same foot with the other relations of life. In it itself, it is not inconsistent with the will of God. It is not sinful. That was from a pulpit. And many, 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 many pulpits. Now, I don't mean, I know you're going to bad a bit. This is stupid gibberish. That is racist, stupid nonsense. And that's a pastor said this. Well, that, David, that was a long time ago. Well, then 100 years later, in 1961, Henry, a pastor... His church had over 3,000 people. He was the president of the Alabama Baptist Convention. All Baptists don't think this. I'm just saying this is a quote from a Baptist. I grew up in Baptist church. Not all races. I'm just saying this is one example. Ladies and gentlemen, for 15 years, I've had the privilege of being a pastor of a white Baptist church in this city. If we stand 100 years from now, it will still be a white church. I'm a believer in separation of the races, and I'm nonetheless uh, nonetheless a Christian. And they applauded. They applauded. If you want to get in a fight with the one that started separation of the races, you come face to face with your God. The difference in color, the difference in our body, our minds, our life, our mission upon the face of this earth is God-given. I'd want to talk to him and say, have you ever read the Bible? Have you read Ephesians? You've not come to grips with the fact that what you're saying is absolutely, the best word is pagan. This is not Christian. Paul would have gone, if he had any hair left, would have pulled it out. This is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. How could you conceivably say such gibberish from the pulpit? Have you read this? We have got to get this right, people. Jesus, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, never wanted just one people group. He never wanted to bless a people group just to bless one people group. Like he says in Isaiah, it was to be a light to the nations. Nations means Gentiles. God has always wanted us all. And so I did, a, I did research. What are the top 10 most populous uh, Christian populations in the world? Top 10, I got them on the screen. And of those top 10, 70% of those top 10 list of countries aren't American. And most of them, of course, aren't white. And so I put that picture on the wall. There's the representatives. Well, look what they look like. Look at their dress and their color of their skin. Imagine the different languages. It's fantastic is what it is. God never wanted just one people group. He never, ever, ever just wanted, never. He never, that was never his intention. And that's Paul's point here. 
When I worked in Houston, one of the places I worked in Houston was at First Methodist at the West Chase campus, and that church, uh, the church building was big and majestic and it was great, but as you walked in the main hall before you got to what we call the sanctuary, we had all the flags represented the nations because it's Houston, and it's, if you don't know, it's like the UN. We had, I think, 39, 38 nationalities represented. And so when, we go, when I'd go to church and the kids grew up this way, they would have... Um, People who were in full-on African garb, or people who were first-generation Mexican-Americans, or second-generation. We had people from Nigeria and Ghana, and uh, I mean, all over the place. And it was awesome. I, I loved it. Not that they're extra holy, but it was just great. We used to a common thing you'd hear around the church all the time was, "This is gonna be like in heaven, isn't it?" It's gonna be like so. You're singing praise songs, and you see people, uh, even the way they manifested their praise, look different. And sometimes we'd have different people translate on the stage, and eventually we had a, a Spanish-speaking service, and they would translate. It was just all together as much as possible. It, it was, and that does not, it's not other cultures' fault that we can't have churches that are that way, but I love how it did represent, at least, that kind of idea that there's, we are one in Christ Jesus. We're one in Christ. I think I've told you a story before. It hit me really hard when I was in uh, Moscow, Russia, a few years ago at a leadership conference. And I'm going there to speak, and I'm thinking, I'm already kind of nervous because I've never been to Russia. And as I'm going, I'm meeting these people for the first time. Probably a quarter of the group I met uh, could speak English. And as soon as I start hearing them pray, as soon as I start hearing them, and someone would translate in my ear, I thought, oh, that's, that's my Jesus too. And we sing these praise songs. Most of them from the 80s and 90s for us, Bennett. But for them, I guess they were fresh. And I thought, I know that tune. And so I would sing in English. And here, of course, I'm absolutely the minority. I'm absolutely the minority, and I thought this is both cool, and it's also a little nerve-wracking because I'm the minority, right? I'm the one that's, when I was, I, and I was in college, I started a male quartet, and we would go around and sing different places where our lead singer was a black guy. John is a great guy, and so when we go to black churches, then the other three of us were the minority. I thought, and I remember telling John, this is what you feel like every time you go to the rest of our churches. All right, he goes, yeah. I said, how do you do it? What's it like for you? What's it like for you? Oh, it depends, and blah, blah, blah. And so you just you're always reminded that that's the same Jesus we're singing and praising, every one of them, every single one of them. I thought, man, this is fantastic. See, right now, back to my analogy of if it were a Mexican religion going to American religion, right now, right now, around the globe, there are more non-white, non-American Christians in the globe than there are white Anglo people in the world right now. And they estimate by 2050, there'll be more Chinese and more African Christians anywhere else in the world. Which means when we get to heaven and the world to come, they won't look like you and me. Most of us are. I'm, you know, I mean, it's, and God's like, uh-huh, good. The more, the merrier. That's one reason why we reach out to and pray for the unreached people groups. We have got to, as Christians, constantly stay mindful of our own tendency to want to stay tribal. And Paul routinely, pastorally face this all the time with what you might call race relations in his churches. Constantly shaking his head, no, 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 we're in Christ Jesus. But man, they're so different. I, not, that, not in Christ, they're not. Right, they're, right, right. Well, you know what they did? No, that, that, that was back then. Well, you know what? No, but they speak, they smell funny. Well, you smell funny to them. Come on now. In Christ Jesus. We don't worship like that. You don't, but they do. Come on now, focus on Jesus. They speak in too much tongues. I don't know what all that not. Come on now, we're in the body of Christ. I, I can't imagine like herding she, uh, cats <laughs> all the time. We've got to stay focused on why we're here, not what we might look like, what our background is. That breeds hostility. The very thing Paul said, he completely broke down on the cross. Completely broke down on the cross. We're all equal together before the Lord Jesus, equal. In verse 19, he says, Paul goes on, so then... Y'all are no longer, that's Gentiles, that's us, strangers and aliens or wanderers, sojourners, but y'all are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. I love all these analogies. Now you're fellow, you're members of a household, like you've been adopted. And then he, gives, he shifts analogies. Now you're built upon the foundation, like you're a house, on the apostles, that is the message of Jesus, and the prophets, he means Christian prophets who were preaching God's, they would literally say God's word, his oracular proclamation. You're built upon the testimony of Jesus. 
Christ Jesus himself being the, the Greek can be cornerstone or capstone. That's a long, nerdy debate, but I think cornerstone is probably right, but it can be the cornerstone or the capstone. I think it's cornerstone. The, the, it's the foundation in Christ Jesus is the main thing that holds it all together. In whom the whole structure, all you architects would love this, the whole structure is joined together, and then he switches analogy, not just any old building, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. In the ancient world, one thing they knew about very well, and that was temples. The temples are all over the place. I, I have a, I don't think I mentioned him yet. There's a guy I work with and mentor. He's a young pastor in South India named Satish. He's 28 years old. And uh, I was on video with him last night for a long time. And uh, but he, we were talking about stuff there going on. I, I try to encourage him and stuff. And he said they pop up temples all over the place. He said the elephant God, the monkey God, the blah God, and the Indian government supports them, not us. And businesses support them, not us. See, they're surrounded by temples. And Paul has in mind one temple in particular, that is the Jewish temple, the one in Israel. And he says, that's you now. So he's picturing this kind of interesting metaphor that as if all the people become the mortar and the rocks, the holes built up. We're just building up this big temple. And on the bottom, as it were, the foundation is the Lord Jesus himself and his testimony. So that we might be the dwelling of the spirit of God. And the temple will, this, I'm sure this is Paul, one of his implicit points, it will come crumbling down without all the parts together. This is not a black temple, white temple, Canadian temple, American temple. It's the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And together, I mean, together, when each is built up whole, he says, look at this structure. Christians ought to be the example to the world of what diversity looks like. We should. We should be the people that the world, how do you do it? Where I come from, all we do is butt heads and fight and kill each other and tribal. How do you Christians do it? And let me tell you exactly how we do it in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great story. Let's sit down and talk about how we don't let race get in the way of our devotion to one another. How do you do it? We should be the world's leading thinkers. There should be a TED Talk channel playlist. And every single specialist who talks about race relations should be a Christian. We should set the tone for the world of what it means. How do you do it? How do you do it? So you don't, you don't make the people live, sit somewhere else and eat. No, we don't do that. Do you know where the black, uh, Af the black Episcopalian church came from? And the black Methodist church came from? Because they wouldn't let the black people sit in front of the church. They made the black people sit outside or on the, the back. And so they left, went next door, and then started their own denomination. So we're constantly reminded of this. We said this day, that's not good, right, Jennifer? It's not good. We should be people go, whoo, look how well we've done in the Lord Jesus. Because together, sisters and brothers in Christ, we're family. And that's one of the reasons I want you to sit close together. It is. It's not, our, we, we can't make people come to Hill Church. We can't, of course not. We, I mean, if I could, I'd try. I'm kidding, I would do it. We can't make them. We can't. I invite, 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 invite. We try our best to produce a conducive environment. We can't make certain cultures live in Kiwa. I know, I know. What we can do is try our best to produce an environment where everyone does feel like they're involved and they're included. And I encourage us, I encourage this morning to really embrace the vision that Paul has for the church. That together we don't see each other as other regardless of what we look like and smell like and how we might worship, we say, no, that was handled a long time ago. That's my sister and brother in Christ. Come sit right beside me. Amen? I hope so. Let's pray this morning. We ask the Lord Jesus for that capacity. First off, I, I thank you, we thank you, that you did do this, that you broke down that wall, as it were, of hostility. And that together, I mean, selfishly, I'm glad because that means I get to be part of it. <laughs> I want to be part of the family of God. And so I'm glad that you made, you allowed a way for us Gentiles to be included in what you're doing in the world through you, Jesus. We praise you for that. We thank you that 
in our churches, we can have access, all of us, and there's no requirement of a certain education or economic level or race or whatever that just our trust and faith in you, our surrendering to you, makes us part of the family. It makes me so happy. I'm glad to be a part of that family. And I know we all are. And Lord Jesus, we praise you for that. We also ask Holy Spirit for your capacity to not think like people who don't think like you, <laughs> to not be influenced by people who want to tell us to keep being tribal, to keep thinking of our own interests and our own little in communities and make that the most important thing. Jesus, perhaps, perhaps there might be people in this room or watching online, if they're honest to you, they are racist. And they look down on people because of a certain reason that's, whatever it is, is gibberish. Would you help them confess that to you as sin, repent of it, and receive your forgiveness and stop doing it? Holy Spirit, if there's anything in our heart and mind this morning at Hill Church, and I mean anything, that blocks us from your blessings, from your fruit, from your activity and what we're trying to accomplish for you because we get in the way because of that, oh God, please have mercy on us. Would you help us be a people... Uh, and I, th I think we have been. I think we have been. I want us to keep being that and keep going forward. Jesus, please help us be a community to the world that shows the world what it looks like to love people just as they are. And that we put our faith in you, the one who is our peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.